So two weeks ago, we saw how to pray the Lord's Prayer. That prayer closed with the requirement to forgive others. Matthew 6.15 saying this, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This week, we look at a parable that Jesus gave us to understand exactly what he's talking about. Praying to God, we are God's children. Which is why the Lord's Prayer starts with our Father. If we are God's children, we're supposed to learn God's character and show God's character. As he showed his loving character to forgive us who were his enemies. We are to show his loving character to forgiving others, uh, whether brethren in church or whether enemies outside the church. How can they come to Christ if we don't show Christ's love? As God's adopted children, we are joint heirs of Jesus who saved us with his own shed blood. He did not have to do it for us. His grace allowed that to happen. 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us upon salvation, we have the might of Christ. We should forgive others uh, as he forgave us because we have his mind of forgiveness. To use that forgiveness to show God's character and God's love. Now without the mind of Christ, we see what's happening in the world today. We demand our rights. Others have violated our rights. Therefore, they don't deserve forgiveness. We need to get everything we can back. Take them to court, do whatever it is to show our vengeance. But with the mind of Christ, we're able to show his character. We can forgive as we see the forgiveness that we've received. We are concerned for their salvation just as Christ was concerned about ours. Led by the Spirit and his character, we have an eternal focus to display the eternal God that they can be eternally saved. And then we can forgive the past sins as they will work to make it, uh, things are right. God is long-suffering. Praise God for that, right? He has given all men the opportunity to be saved. Uh, his grace is only available, however, as long as we have breath. Once our breath is gone, night comes, the time for salvation is past. That's true for people inside the church. It's true for people outside the church. Let's look how to seek comfort uh, over our sins without salvation, evidenced by our lack of God's character and forgiveness. You cannot find comfort unless you have the mind of Christ. So please stand and give honor to God's word as you read Matthew 18, 21 to 35. So Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay his debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry, and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Dear Heavenly Father, we see the importance of forgiveness. We know that we have been forgiven a debt that we could not pay. We know that you had to send your son to die on the cross to make it so that we could be called sons and daughters of the Most High God through faith in the blood of Christ, shed for the remission of sins. And without that, Lord, there is no way we could approach you. And Lord, we know that our sin has done far more damage to the kingdom of heaven than any slight that could possibly be done to us. Let us therefore learn of the character of God. Let us learn 
to be true joint heirs of Jesus Christ, showing the forgiveness that you showed us, that people may see the character of God, that people may be drawn to the character of God, that people may uh, uh, be gloriously saved for our joy and your glory. And let us learn of that, Lord, how to do it, what is the requirement, why the requirement is there, and let us have joy of knowing that you are with us and will provide all things, no matter what the world does to us. We ask in precious sons your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. So, we see here a man under God's long-suffering grace, willing to be forgiven for the rebellion he'd shown against the kingdom. He wasted all of, of the, king's, the king's goods. Absolutely wasted them. But seeing that there's a limit to that amazing grace. This parable expounds on Peter's question, which showed spiritual growth. Peter was showing great spiritual growth in this time. And he comes to Jesus, and he's trying to understand the mind of Christ. Now, in Jewish tradition, and Peter was trained in Jewish tradition, they said that you are to forgive someone three times, but not four. So what did Peter say here? Should I forgive him seven times? That's more than double what he'd been taught. So three plus three is six. So he's going double plus one. Did he understand that uh, the perfect number was seven? I don't know for certain. But he had shown great uh, growth. Well, Jesus takes him a step further. Not seven times. Seventy times seven. How many of you have failed someone 490 times? <laughs> Fortunately, that's not what he's talking about. 490 times is not, it was not the idea. The idea was it's a large number that should not be taken in the back of your mind. We have an attitude of forgiveness. Well, for, with forgiveness comes forgetting. As uh, Isaiah 43, 25 says about God to us, I, even I, and he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake. Next line, for us is very important. And will not remember thy sins. If we have God's character, I am not to remember the sins that are against me. Once it's taken care of, they're forgotten. If I've forgotten them, how can I ever get to 490? But the idea is, uh, put, the, uh, put those sins against you in the past. Give them forgiveness and have joy of moving forward just as Christ has forgotten our sins. The parable shows a fruit of salvation. Learning and showing God's character as you pray uh, for God's grace. And also seeing what false progressions look like. Uh, professions, excuse me. Uh, seeing, uh, seeing accepting God's grace while demanding your rights in this world. And understanding forgiveness, the parable shows four things. God's uh, spirit of forgiveness, man's spirit of unforgiveness, God's limits of saving grace, there is a limit of saving grace, and man's rewards of unrighteousness. So first of all, God's spirit of forgiveness. God is king, sovereign over all his creation. Every one of us is a servant of God, whether we've accepted that or not. We see ungodly uh, things happening in politics. We see ungodly leaders. We see ungodly actions from our president, from Congress, and everything else, and yet, they are God's servants. They will be called to account for the stewardship of uh, where they've been placed. They will not like the response if they do not repent of their ways. Well, as uh, servants, our lives are to be judged according to his, uh, his uh, standards. As rebellious sinners, we have earned the wages of sin. We have earned uh, the judgment that's coming. Romans 6.23 is saying those wages are uh, death. And that's an eternal death in hell. It's a debt we cannot pay, as all have sinned against God. And God's standard is very simple in his kingdom. It's perfection. Absolute holy, holy perfection. None of us can stand against that standard. None of us. And therefore, we must have Christ shed his blood, and by that shed blood, uh, have our sins covered, if we accept that as payment for our sins. Do so, we receive that forgiveness. We are declared holy. We are allowed into his kingdom. Uh, and God was willing to do it, as John 3, 16 uh, tells us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have an eternal life. So we're looking for eternal life. We're looking for that grace that God gave us, and God will give it to us. And once he gives it to us, we are adopted to his family. Adopted to his family, we are to learn his character. We are to show his character to others. Now, the dead of this particular servant, who had been seen, who saw that grace, was 10,000 talents. Big number. 10,000 talents is a whole lot of silver, a whole lot of gold. So, what is that big number? It's sort of like our debt that we have in this country. It's very similar in ways. Adam Clark, when he wrote his, uh, his uh, commentary in 1831, 
said this debt was the equivalent of the entire uh, British Empire at the time. You think that he could ever repay that debt? That debt was obviously unpayable. And somehow this, uh, this uh, servant was called in front of his God to reckon about this debt. He recognized the debt sentence. He recognized what it meant. Uh, and he cried out for time to repay it. Now, look at, that, look at that national debt clock behind us. Could you imagine? Bill, could you imagine ever having enough time to pay that debt off? <laughs> that is the ridiculousness of this request. He was grasping the straws, begging for anything to have more time, begging for time for grace on a debt that could never be paid. His debt was great. But our God is rich in mercy, with great love shown in Ephesians 2, 4, and verse 5, uh, adding, He quickened us with Christ, as we are dead in our sins. By grace are you saved. It's Romans 6, 23. We already saw the first part, where we've earned the death in hell, every one of us. But it says, For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Um, we have eternal life if we have faith in God. We come through Christ, through his shed blood, he declares us righteous. God offered the gift. We're going to see it next week. All you have to do is receive it. That's, that's the extent of forgiveness for us. All we have to do is receive that gift. Now, once we receive that gift, we have the mind of Christ. We learn to develop the mind of Christ, to show the mind of Christ, that others may be drawn to Christ, that they may then be gloriously saved. It's a learning process. How many of you are good at using it? Notice my hand's not up either. It's a learning process. We're children of God, learning how to come closer to God. God redeems the unredeemable by the blood of Christ. He is love. He is good. He is long-suffering. Why would he forgive the debts? Well, Romans 2, 4 answers that. Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, and, and not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? His long-suffering grace is to show people that he is loved, he is willing to forgive, and by doing that, it leads us to repent to that great God, giving him the glory he deserves, giving him the worship he deserves. That's his point. Such a glorious gift. Uh, an eternally unpayable debt, fully forgiven, stamped, paid in full, then tore up and thrown away like it was never there. This person had that great forgiveness. All of a sudden, that great burden was off his back. All of a sudden, I can live again. I can breathe again. I don't have to worry about it. But Christ is subverted. He forgot the God, or the king in this case, which is God, had forgiven it to us. There's a danger in this attitude. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verses uh, 1 to 6. And we see the danger of this kind of thinking. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Therefore, believing the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works uh, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and are made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good works of God and the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. There's a great gift. There's a great, excuse me, a great uh, danger of seeing the goodness of God, the grace of God, the long-suffering of God, and then mocking that by not taking that character and showing it and learning of, of it to show others. God is long-suffering, but it is limit, limited. And we see that with man's uh, spirit of unforgiveness. So, this man has been forgiven of his debt. He now can walk away, all burdens gone. Now, when we were saved, that burden of sin was gone. It was removed totally from us. We never had to worry about it again. We learned to live under it, under God's care, under God's long suffering, under God's grace, under God's love. And we try now to show that love to others. We try to live according to the Bible. We fail miserably. But our long suffering God will continue to train us, continue to move forward. But if we mock it and we go back to serve the kingdom of darkness after he's called us out of it, there's a danger. Our sins against God and his holiness cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, accepted. His love sent his son to cover those sins to his righteous. If I go in front of a holy God in my flesh, 
I'm bankrupt. I cannot stand that because I have sin. His standard is holiness. It, I have to have the blood covered. The blood covering that sin. With that blood covering that sin, I can go to the Holy of Holies anytime I want. But that's what it takes. Reliance on that, not on myself. Not demanding my rights, but going because of His grace. Saying as God, He saw the love of God and the possibility of being accepted by God by repenting of His sins. This is what that servant saw. Now he's a test of his character. You will be tested in your character all the time. You know, if we're not tested, we don't grow. You know, how many of you exercise? You know, when you exercise, what happens? Is it really fun pushing against that, doing all that work, doing all that thing that makes you lose your breath, that makes you sore, things like that? No, it makes you stronger. And that's what God does. He tests you. He puts out things. He makes it so you can learn his character. And when you fail, he'll correct you if the attitude is correct. He's here, uh, this man showed his attitude was not right. Test of his character comes with a servant having a very small amount eligible. An incredibly small amount. 100 pence. Basically, it's a buck. So this man uh, goes to someone who owes him a buck. He, he just had the entire amount of the British Empire as debt forgiven. And now he comes to this servant. You owe me a buck. Pay up, pal. Begs what his attitude was. This showing how other people's sin against us are absolutely nothing compared to what our sin has done to a holy God. This scene is identical. We look at what happened. The scene is actually identical to the one we just saw. The servant with a great debt went to his king and said, uh, forgive me, give me time. The man who owes him a buck said the exact same thing. We see an absolute parallel with everything except the amount of the debt. Obviously, this servant did not take a lesson of God's character to forgive others as he had been forgiven. With such a sin against him, to get his buck back, he despitefully used him. Took him by the scruff of the neck, basically threw him against the wall. Pay what you owe me. No love shown at all. No care, no God's character at all. The other servant admitted his debt. Yes, I owe you. Give me patience and I will pay. Now, there's a slight difference between the two. Both of them said the same thing. The first servant, the unforgiving one, had no ability to pay that debt. The, the buck that the other one owed, I think he could probably earn enough to pay that eventually. The unforgiving servant demanded his rights today with no mercy. Taking vengeance, he cast him into prison until he could pay. Here's a question for you. I've taken this man, I am so angry with him, I want to throw him in prison, now you'll save it to your pay. Anyone ever figure out how you earn a buck in prison? <laughs> it was strictly vengeance. Uh, nothing else. So he was just angry, showing vengeance. And he forgot uh, Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now vengeance is for rebellion, not temporary slights that uh, could be repaid. This man had debt, no question about it. He owed him money. Uh, he should have paid. But uh, the, the amount he owed was nothing. The vengeance he received was not in comparison to uh, what should have been shown. And he was willing to pay. The, so this servant shows unreasonable wrath after rece receiving unreasonable forgiveness. Every one of you here today who is saved, every one of you here today, when the rapture happens, will be called into the clouds to meet with our Savior. Every one of you do not deserve. You've been unreasonably saved. There is nothing in you that earned that salvation. There is nothing in you that made it so that debt could be repaid, and yet our God repaid it. Our God forgave that debt, threw it away, and you no longer have to worry about it. So that's the kind of forgiveness this servant received. And yet he shows now unreasonable vengeance against some of those on the block. Now he had the right to be repaid, and that's other servant admitted it. Proverbs 22, 7. The borrower is servant to the lender. Now, had the man worked with him, said, well, how are you going to, how are you going to pay that buck? Maybe he can work for you. There's many different ways you could have done it. And he'd done this. Showed God's character. Showed God's love. Then, both of their spirits would have been lifted. The man would have, the man would have received his buck eventually, and the other person would have appreciated the ability to pay that buck back. Exodus 22, 26 gives some idea of this love. Uh, as it said, you know, Rich owes, me, Rich owes me money. I take his blanket as surety. Okay? That was, that was what they did. But it said in Exodus 26, if you do that, before nightfall, give it back to him. 
No, don't make it so he freezes to death. What was the purpose of taking that surety? It was not to, I'm going to show you, you're going to freeze that until you pay me back. That wasn't the point. The point of taking it was as a reminder to repay, working with that person to help him repay, and forgiving a debt if serious problems came up. No? God, did, God owns, everything, owns everything, right? So if he puts us in a situation where we have to forgive another's debt, he'll give us the ability to do exactly that. God showed this servant exactly how to forgive another's sight debt. Uh, yet this greatly loved and forgiven servant missed the lesson, and he showed Satan's hate over a pitifully small amount. He was not uh, showing God's character at all. As 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us, not, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Loving as God loves allows you to abide uh, in God, and he in you, allowing your prayers to be answered. If you do not love and refuse to forgive others, you're not showing his character, his love, and therefore you not, are not of God. Forgetting uh, that a loving God forgave you of all your sins, all your burdens, they're all gone. Don't put burdens on someone else for no reason. You cannot have prayers heard as you are not his son at that point. Because 1 John 4, 8 says this, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Again, are there unlovable people out there? Yeah, yeah there are. Uh, but God's character allows us to show love to them. You know, quite frankly, you were too lovable to God before he saved you. He died when you were his enemy, rebelling against him. And he was willing to send his son to die for you. Well, what he asked us to do is nothing in comparison to that. So, because of that, if you do not show that love, you'll find out there's limits to God's saving grace. So here we see a tear in God's field. A man God sent Christ to die for, to redeem the unredeemable. I'm willing to forgive all your debt. You know, John 3.16 says he loved the world so much and he gave his only begotten son. That blood of Christ is enough to save the entire world. All you have to do is receive it. If you repent of your sins, those sins are gone. Now, this man is a man who saw the compassion of God, but was unwilling to show that compassion to another. He rejected God's character to demand his rights in this world. He wanted to be in Satan's kingdom but have God's forgiveness. Well, a lot of people are today, unfortunately. A man arrived at so ungodly, he actually caused pain to other, other uh, servants. They saw the injustice and prayed for God's grace. God saw the great injustice and corrected this problem. Luke 18, 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear along with him? No. He saw this is my servant. This is my servant that uh, I also forgave his debt. So, he owes the guy a buck. I just forgave him of a kingdom's worth of debt, and he's doing this to one of my servants? This will not stand. This is what God was saying. He would avenge that servant. And we see God is long-suffering. 1 John 2, 2 says, uh, And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, but also the sins of the whole world. Understanding that and having the mind of Christ, forgiveness would come naturally as you have the love of Christ. If you're in the love of Christ, as you develop the love of Christ, as you mature in the love of Christ, forgiveness comes naturally because uh, that is what God has called us to do. Now turn to Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. So Matthew 22, starting in verse 7. Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On the, uh, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What he's saying is loving your neighbor as yourself is proof that you love God. You have concern for your neighbor. You want to see your neighbor saved. You want nobody to go to hell. If they go to hell, there's nothing you can do about it. But, but you don't decide that. And do everything you can to show love for that person can be redeemed. Because you know the love of Christ redeemed you. And you want to see God glorified by having another sinner who is as zealous as you were before a salvation come to that saving grace. This is a man who faced a crisis and cried out to God. He wasn't sorry for his sin. Make no mistake. You see that by his actions. He was sorry for the penalty of those sins. He recognized the death sentence. He recognized he was about to be cast in the prison for the rest of his life. And he begged for grace. 
Judgment forgotten? He then forgot God. Seeking to please his flesh instead of the spirit of God. Uh, shocking those loving God by his ungodly behavior. The servant found the limits of God's long suffering grace. If you mock his grace, you will find his wrath. See his, uh, see his truth and reject it, demanding your own rights, you'll face his judgment. Notice that Jesus said to, uh, about the Heavenly Father, he said, my Heavenly Father. What is the, what is the comment called Lord's Prayer said? Our Father. He didn't say our Father. He was rejected from the family. He was not part of the family. Jesus didn't say ours. If he talks to you, he's going to say our Father. Because you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. This man was not a joint heir with Jesus Christ because Jesus said, my Father. Scary thing. Attack his brethren, you'll find his vengeance. Hebrews 10, 26, 27 says this. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Sin willfully and refuse to forgive, your prayers will not be heard. You will see the character he is not one that accepted God's gift, not uh, uh, repenting of your sins, but only seeking the benefits and seeing the truth of those benefits, but not uh, giving yourself to those, uh, to that God who gave them. You'll be rejected. And at that point, there is no, you're done. You know? I've seen the gift of God, I'm going to reject it. I like this side much better. I like serving Satan. I like to please the flesh. That's the danger that you face with God's long-suffering care. There's a point where you can't return. He was shown God's grace. He was shown God's love. He was forgiven of his debt, and yet he rejected it and went back to the world. So man's reward for unforgiveness, we see it in this parable. Our God and his love provide his own son for all men to be saved. Everyone driving by right now, mocking his church as they drive by, he died for them too. They can come and get saved anytime they so desire. Their uh, sin is no greater than mine for rejecting that God. So the question is, uh, what will they do? When they reject it, there is a limit and there's a punishment for it. He, showed, uh, he should sent his son showing the great cost of sin against his kingdom. His son had to face separation on the cross as he shed his own blood on our behalf in the most horrific way possible. Accept this gift as a penalty for your sins. You will never face death that you deserve. You will only have joy that you've been forgiven, and you can display that joy to others, and that's what will draw people to God. You see much joy on Fox News these days? There's anger. There's fighting. There's nothing. People are looking for something different. They want to see God's character. They want to see God's love. If we show it to them, those who can be saved will be saved. If we don't, what's the point? One more argument. Big deal. We need to show God's character to shock people out of uh, their sinful habits and realize there is a God in heaven. This man has shown the glory of God, seeing the forgiveness of his debts if he served the King of Kings, but a return to the vomit of his old ways, serving the pitiful point of potentate of uh, hell's kingdom, and you will receive the benefits of serving that king forevermore. God is long-suffering, but you must accept his gift as long as his day. Night comes where God will call all to give account. Hebrews 9, 26, 27 says this. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's the ultimate end of his long-suffering love for us. The unforgiving servant wanted his forgiveness of sin to avoid hell, but have the right to continue in sin, demanding his rights on this earth. The two do not go together. You serve God or mammon. You cannot serve both. He desired the benefits of forgiveness, but rejected the character of heaven that would forgive that debt. He forfeited the right to heaven, as he would not show God's character of forgiveness for the slight trespass of a fellow servant in light of the great gift of salvation offered to him. Mocking the gift given, instead to serve Satan. The other servant found it a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry servant to whom, whom he owes so little. The unforgiving servant, on the other hand, found the truth of Hebrews 10.31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, failing even to try to show God's love to another after being offered all God's love, being given the kingdom, yet rejecting it so he can have his buck. 
He will face God at the great white throne judgment. He will have his sins judged, and he will be cast into hell forevermore. But he has his luck. And that's pretty much what we choose in this world. Do you want to have uh, uh, vengeance against someone? To receive what you deserve in this world according to the world? Or do you want the kingdom? Those are two choices. Forgive others, you have the kingdom. Because you've taken the love of God, you've gone to the cross, you've accepted the blood of your payment, and then you work on developing the character of love by showing that forgiveness. So, as we look at this, God offers to forgive us of a debt that we can never repay. In return, accepting that gift, we become his children. Becoming his children, we're supposed to learn the rules of the family. We're supposed to learn the grace that's shown us to show others. We're supposed to uh, develop that character. None of us are good at it. We still have the flesh. But the idea is to have the attitude of learning how to do exactly that. As he forgave us, we're to forgive others that they may see God's character and be drawn to that forgiveness. Realizing there is something after death. Realizing there is a heaven, there is a hell, and you choose which one you go to. God sends nobody to hell. Hell is where we go. God's love made us a way to escape that hell. And by showing God's character, we can draw people to that character and they can accept that salvation he gave us. Refuse to forgive a person for a slight in this life? How can you possibly expect God to forgive you for your rebellious attacks by sin against his kingdom? Now forgiveness in the flesh is not easy. It's not by our character. We're fallen. We accept Satan's, uh, Satan's gifts, quote unquote, by Eve eating the fruit, to uh, have more in the flesh. And because of that, we have Satan's character. It's not easy to learn uh, God's character, but we are to, we are to try to we're to have the attitude of forgiveness. And doing so, we can get better at it. And if we rely on God using God's mind and God's character, we can do exactly that. So, we need to forfeit our rights in the flesh to learn to live in the spirits. Now, we can see God's blessings for all in Cory Ten Boom. Cory Ten Boom, of course, was, uh, went, to the, went to the concentration camps, and when she came out, losing her sister in those uh, concentration camps, she started talking about the love of God. And we see in this uh, story that she gives an example of exactly how to forgive and how you need to rely on God when you think you can't do it and let God work through you. Cory Ten Boom and her family secretly housed Jews in their house during World War II. Their illegal activity was discovered, and Corey and her sister Betsy were sent to the German death camp, Ravensbrück. There, Corey would watch many, including her sister, die. After the war, she returned to Germany to declare the grace of Christ. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And even though I cannot find a scripture for it, I believe God then places a sign out there saying, uh, no fishing allowed. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and a brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a cap with a skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man, I could see my sister Frail's form in front of me, ribs sharper beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. That place is great as broke. And the man who was making his way toward me had been a guard, one of the most cruel guards. Now, he was in front of me. Hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take, out, take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him. I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, his hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. 
I whose sins had again and again to be forgiven. I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could have been many seconds that, that he stood there, hand held out. But to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus said, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust out my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started into my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joint hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even then, I realized it was not my love. I had tried, and I did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. That is how we need to show forgiveness for others. Now, none of us has been, had, had uh, as much against us as Corey Tendall did. And we see the difficulty of forgiveness. Now, could you forgive someone easily if they were the cause of a loved one's death? If they had been so cruel against you? We see she had difficulty doing it. Because she still had this had this uh, I, uh, this flesh around her, and I got to tell you, it'd be difficult for me. But she saw that she had to do it. She had to show the love of God, Christ, because Christ showed much love to her. And by asking for God's power, God's grace, God's strength, she was able to do it. And then she received the joy of being able to do it. And that uh, that uh, uh, guard would see the love of God, Christ, and would be able to show that to other guards. That is how we have to forgive others. Like I said, it's not easy, but we need to do it. And we often have to pray for God's power to do it. Let us forgive others our tr the trespasses that God will forgive ours. Lift those with dead against you in prayer that God will hear and elevate both of you. Show love to someone. You have the right to receive uh, debt back if, you, if uh, the person has the ability to pay. But show love to that person that God will lift both your spirits. Show the love of God to all. And having a forgiving attitude that God may then accept you in prayer. And that you'll show that kind of love. And God will give you even more joy. No, she had, Corey Tindall had no joy until she acted upon the requirement of forgiveness. You receive joy by doing what God calls you to do. And God will give you the power to do it. And as we saw there with Corey Tindall, her works. So, as we get ready to pray, first of all, ask God for a forgiving spirit. We have, the, we're not, we have the mind of Christ. We are God's children. Therefore, we're supposed to show God's character, right? We're supposed to show God's character. We're supposed to forgive others' trespasses as he's forgiven us. Nobody has come close to doing to me what I did to God with my sin, and yet God forgave me. That's what we need to remember. And we need to do that. And we need to go to prayer to ask God to develop that in us. You know? we're, we're children of the Most High God. We need to learn to be spiritual adults. And we need to go do that by prayer. So, Let's ask God for a forgiving spirit. And then, if you can think of anybody that has wronged you in the past and you have a grudge against them, ask God to give you the strength to go to that person and tell them you forgive them. Or ask forgiveness from someone you've wronged. And then, after that, I'll close with some prayer. And then we'll uh, uh, sing what we need to do for everybody to make me a blessing. So let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Dearly Father, I stand in front of you, a sinner, with a debt greater than that servant in the parable of the day. A debt that could never be paid. A debt that would keep me away from the kingdom forevermore. And yet, Lord, by the blood of Christ, you have cleansed me of that great debt. You have covered that filth on my uh, flesh. Give me a white robe of righteousness and allow me into your kingdom. And Lord, uh, my, debt, my sin against you is greater than I could ever repay. That's true with everybody here. And yet you've forgiven me. And Lord, we need to show that same character, that same, for same forgiveness to others. Realizing that many of may have wronged us, but they have wronged us not more near a how wronged you, and they need to see the same love that you showed us. Lord, it's a difficult thing. We live in a world of hate. We live in a world where people cheat. They lie. They steal. And yet, Lord, we have the kingdom. You own all things. And Lord, if they take it, you will repay that uh, with their vengeance that's required unless they become saved. And if we show your character of love, Lord, maybe they will be saved. Maybe we can make enemies friends by showing the love of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would give each of us the power, the wisdom, the ability to forgive others. It is difficult, Lord. It is something that is not natural for us, but it is something with the mind of Christ that you can give us. And Lord, I pray that we would hold on to the character of God, learn from you every, each and every day, learn how to forgive others, that they may see forgiveness, and that they may come to you for forgiveness of their sins. And Lord, I pray that, that we would have more joy as we see more people come to you, that receive the great gifts of salvation and become our brethren rather than our enemies. And Lord, we're thankful for the great gift you've given us. For the blood of Christ shed on the cross for remission of sins. And let us focus on that for all things that happen in this world. Not worrying about the slights that may happen here, because we know we have the kingdom forevermore. And we give thanks, praise, honor, and glory, and we ask all of it. Your precious son's your name. Amen. Amen. And so turn to him uh, 475 and, and learn what we need to do in this world. And that's to make me a blessing. Please do stand and join me in singing hymn number 475. And all three of these verses, the words are so powerful, I wouldn't know which one to take out if we were going to do that. So we're going to sing all three verses.
show your love to others, you will be, you will make, be made a blessing. They may not accept it. They may reject it. But you need to do your part to be a blessing. Go ahead. Thank you for uh, being with us today, and you are dismissed.